We've talked a lot about the superpowers of Austin and how one of them is we leverage the power of AND. A lot of that has to do with the fact that we have the convergence of technologies. So today we wanted to talk about that and bring our own power of AND. So we're bringing back Brett Hurt and William Hurley to the podcast to talk about this subject. Brett, Worley, welcome back to Austin Next. Thank you. Great to be here. So we've talking a lot about tech convergence and what does that mean? A lot of this has been prompted by the blogs that you've been writing, Brett, and then, of course, the uh, South by fully AI generated uh, presentation that you gave Worley. So I kind of wanted to start there and kind of the things you've been writing about. So, Brett, I kind of want to start with you in this. You had some really interesting blog posts about like the fourth surge of data. Talk about that. What do, you, what do you actually mean? What is the fourth surge? Yeah, so the the fourth surge is obviously we were entering into a world of more and more quantification. Like when I was in Alaska two years ago, um, my wife and I went there because we were worried about getting stuck outside the U.S. because of the pandemic. Um, I was on a train and the trains are just beautiful there and in the middle of nowhere. And I just had this overwhelming thought of like all of this is going to be quantified. Like we're in the middle of nowhere, but all of this is going to be quantified. Actually, we're investors and companies that um, that take satellite data and quantify that. And just on that train, I was like, I just had this overwhelming feeling. Of, okay, what's the world going to be like then? And we've been increasingly quantifying the world and companies have been increasingly quantifying every aspect of their business with Internet of Things and just... All of that, and that even to some extent started with Walmart a long time ago, where they were beaming via satellites up anytime products were bought and being able to fulfill very quickly to replenish in the stores, and that became a huge competitive advantage. In this this force surge, really the big, big factor that's changed is that we're meeting the quantification of the world getting it to a crescendo where you can really transform business at a level that's never been seen before, combined with generative AI, where you're going to be able to have conversations with your data. And what would your data tell you if it could speak to you, if it had a personality? And we've been all in on that at Data.World, and it's incredibly exciting time for our product roadmap. And the fact that we're built on a knowledge graph, we're the only ones in the data catalog space built that way. And so the way a knowledge graph works is when data comes in, It three-dimensionalizes it and maps it in concepts in a graph that are very much like the way our brain works. And so putting generative AI on top of that is super, super exciting. And so we're in the we're in the early, early innings of that for surge right now. And the net result is going to be a massive increase in productivity, a massive increase in efficiency as a result. And higher revenue producing and and everything else. I was just on a a call right before this with one of the biggest software service companies in the world. And we're talking about the compounding gains that are going to happen for the early adopters. I mean, I'll give you a very simple example that's not related to data.world that anybody could do today. We ran a controlled test of our engineering team and we put out just to just to preface this, over a thousand product releases a year. This is the most innovative software as a service company I've ever been a part of. And that's just a part of our motion. We release two to three times a day, but how much goes into those releases really matters. And we did a controlled test recently with um, with GitHub Copilot. This is actually a while back. So recently in my time, maybe like a month ago, where we took some of our best engineers and in one week, how much more productive would this make them? How much more could we get into a release? And it was over a 30% increase. Um, and these are already 10X engineers. These are people who are, who, as you said, 10X engineers who are used to the tech space, but then even you go down, like, you know, we all have children and how fast, you know, my nine-year-old is adopting this and is really, and it was always funny because I, I tried to get him interested in it when like, mm-hmm. oh, look at the stories it could be. And like, wasn't interested. And then I helped, had him start doing some of his homework and definition. Then it got really interesting. Then it was like, oh, I like how fast this helps me of actually course. understand things. And now he likes using, you know, mid journey to help me come up with images for some of the, you know, like some of the LinkedIn posts that I do. And just that productivity gain that 
they're all going to be used to. Like I, I expect to write, you know, a long form paper in, in a day instead of, you know, weeks of research. Right. Yeah. And, and what what human being does not like to be much more productive at tasks that are obsolete once you have technology that comes along. So one of the things- Department of Motor Vehicles. <laughs> it's the Department of Motor Vehicles. Um, I would actually argue even the people <laughs> at the Department of Motor Vehicles um, have been radically more efficient because of technology. Oh, 100%. Thank goodness, right? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> for the internet and for all of the connected systems they See, have See, that's there. because you're in Texas, not in California. <laughs> okay, well, I, I can't compare the DMV there to here. I just don't know. But, you know, this force surge, obviously, it's going to affect everything. It's going to radically impact our productivity at data.world at Aria's. I mean, of course, as soon as that we did that study, we unleashed it on every engineer to increase their productivity and with guidelines, because there are certain things you need to be mindful of when you do that. Those are going to be normal type of guidelines, nothing extreme for us. And then we've just layered in all this generative AI capabilities into our actual product. And the way that's operating with our customers is giving them a really radical lift in efficiency because they're swimming in seas of data. And ultimately, where all that's going to go, again, is to what would your data tell you if you had a conversation with it versus you've been trying to have a conversation with it for years, decades of, you know, innovation and data analytics, but it's not as efficient as it is going to be now. And so it's, we're in that for surge and we're right at the beginning of it. One of the most frustrating things when I, when I used to run an intelligence team was we wanted to always kind of try out these, like, maybe there might be something interesting over here, but sending an analyst down a rabbit hole for three days that might produce nothing was a waste of time. So we couldn't actually go do that exploration right? versus if you had these kind of tools, sending them down a rabbit hole for an hour is totally worth it. They could discover something that you then automate and create new. And this is some of the stuff that, that got me really excited kind of from a competitive intelligence, market intelligence, being able to really discover new things that can help out companies and help out kind of insights for whether customer insights, you know, market insights or whatever. Right. Yeah. And I mean, you know, we see examples of a lack of data analysis at companies where you just think it's a normal thing. I mean, that was the SVB blow up, you know, Worley covered that in his awesome South by Southwest talk written by uh, chat GPT. I yeah. think you used GPT four uh, for that, or you rewrote it in GPT four. Yeah. And, you know, that, that kind of ludicrousness where it's like, how do you not do the basic financial analysis and how do the ratings agencies not the, do the basic financial analysis? And, you know, sometimes just the most basic thing you lose because you miss the forest because of the trees. And that's where some of these tools are incredibly good. Like, like if you could just have a conversation with your data or have a conversation with all of your financial data is really you know, alluded to in a South by Southwest talk, what would it tell you and what would it tell you to do differently? And would it tell you like, hey, you're being really idiotic right now because you have so much money in um, long dated treasuries during a time where interest rates are rapidly increasing so that inflation can get under control. And this is going to potentially put you out of business. And and so there's just so many comedy of errors when it comes to like people at SVB might have been incredibly good at the micro level, but just completely miss the macro. And there's so many examples of that throughout the world. It's amazing you bring up the, the Silicon Valley Bank deal because it wasn't just them. The, you know, we hear about the Federal Reserve and their stress tests, and this is a world I come out of many, many years ago, but... We were looking at the stress test the other day, and there was nothing in there about a rapid increase in interest rates. Yeah. So it's like everybody was fighting the last war, and they forgot about what would happen if. But you talked about this a little bit in your South By, in your presentation there. And I think everybody there was blown away when you announced towards the end of your talk 
that the talk was written by an AI. The graphics were done by an AI. Obviously, you did this with a lot of intent. There was a reason you did it. But it was a risk. It, yeah. So, well, first of all, I, I have to, I'm trying to correct this record. So I narrated a talk completely written by an AI, right? Yeah. So like there were things in there I didn't necessarily disagree with or I was like, wouldn't have said that that way. It listened to about 40 talks of mine on video. And apparently the further you go back in time, the more I said, et cetera which is in that talk a lot, right? It's a <laughs> teleprompter, so I kept reading it, right? But, but I mean, just to be really clear, what was, what was interesting about that was, was it presented a unique opportunity. One, we've never been busier at Strangeworks. We've been waiting for the intersection of AI and quantum for, you know, five, six years now. And so we're super busy. So one, it was kind of nice to be not stressing over the normal amount of work I'd put into the talk. I'm not going to lie. Like you, Forrest, will hate me saying that, but it's true. I was like, man, lazy is awesome. Um, <laughs> but when I first got the idea was when we were going to submit a talk. And so I said, you know, I, I built a prompt, uh, you know, that would make other prompts and circle around a couple of different AIs and come back. And it gave me a title and it gave me an abstract. Okay. Uh, now the title I gave the quantum mania part I made up, and that's about the extent of the prompt it got, was it's on this, and it's on the convergence of quantum and AI, right? That was, it was a very short, non-detailed prompt. And then through it reprompting and all, it built the abstract and everything, and I submitted to South by, and then it got accepted. And then I didn't tell my team, and I waited literally till last minute. It was like, here's how this presentation is going to come together. Uh, Must have loved you for that. They did. There's a great, <laughs> in the presentation, there's a great screenshot of all of them going like, What? To be fair, you did apologize to them I on did, stage. I did apologize yeah. to them on stage, but it was but it was worth it. And so the funny thing is to get – the funny thing are the conversations I've had since where people are like, okay, I don't agree with what you said. And you're like, that's okay. I didn't say it. Like I'm not offended by that at all. Like they weren't my words, literally. And then for people to realize like, wait a second, what do you mean? Because they assume that there's some editing, there's some stuff. And the, the whole idea was just be raw and be like, this could be the worst South by decision I've ever made, or maybe it's okay. And fortunately, I think it fell on the okay side. Yeah. But we live in this amazing time to be alive. I mean, what, what Brett's saying is so true about everything. I just got back from a CEO summer at, uh, out in the middle of the desert. And every company that was in AI was like talking about stuff I've heard, you know, you talk about for years, right? Now everybody's like... Your data will talk to you and stuff like you know. It's like you probably feel like I feel with some of the stuff we're doing. It's like right, that's yeah. the same thing. You know, like we got our new investment round. It was like the pitch wasn't any different than it's been for five years. It's just like markets catch up, people start yeah. waking up to what's going on. Timing around. is everything. Timing is everything. I mean, I've been thinking this way literally since I was a kid. I, right. I was having debates with teachers back when I was eleven years old about how much technology is going to accelerate everything. And even growing up here in Austin teachers were telling me, well, what if it replaces our jobs? And I was like, no, 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 no. You're going to race along with the machines and it'll make your jobs so much better. So I've been, it's I've been bang- thinking about this for a long time. And this is the most exciting and unsettling time at the same time in my life. I, I got to tell a technology you, perspective. I, I 100% agree. I'm not that unsettled. I, I'm just, I see a lot of the arguments that are going around. They, they annoy me almost because it's like, if I look back on all of human history at our ability to tech, you know, predict what tech will change, how it will change us, like we're really bad at that. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, like, we are. like we the are. evidence is 100 percent. That's, that's the one thing we, we can predict. We, we're we, bad yes, at predicting. We, yeah. we are not really good at that. But now all those points. And, you know, for me, chat GPT took me back to sixth grade at Lamar Middle School in Temple where I signed up for a computer class as an elective. And I've always been more of a hacker, right? And so I'm getting the same results, but I'm not getting into the process. And I'll never forget that Professor Scott said, uh, told my parents at a parent-teacher meeting that like in the future, even a cash register at McDonald's will be a computer. Your son will not be able to get a job at McDonald's, right? right <laughs> Which right. was, and, and that the argument we had was over the fact that I said that software at, at a very young age, I still thought software would go away, right? Uh, I, I've always been a big ambient compute believer, I've worked at several startups and stuff in that area and, and projects at Apple and IBM and others. I I just think that like, you know, where computing goes is it does become your third brain. It's like, you know, if you've got your brain and your gut's your second brain, you now have a third brain. And and there's no reason to fear it. The people who adopt it 
are going to have massive short-term opportunities. Those will kind of tail off and you know on a long tail as we go in the future. The people who don't are not necessarily going to be left behind because I do think this is going to kind of rising tide floats all boats, but they're they're going to be disadvantaged. Like there's no doubt mm-hmm. um, because they don't totally accept right. it because they're uncomfortable with it, you know. And it's like you can't do that. And why would you? Right. You know, I don't understand the I don't understand the the trepidation around it. I, well, well, as we get into this, I will qualify why I'm unsettled. It's not because I'm not incredibly optimistic. So I'm not in the kind of what like are you unsettled shut it about? down. But is, well, so is it, so is for it me, the... for me, every time a massive technological shift comes along, it's unsettling from the standpoint of I feel like I need to race much harder to keep up and 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 basically take advantage of that trend. Like I would have been, you know, one of the, one of the pieces I wrote recently was about how much the digital calculator was really fought for a long mm-hmm. time in schools, like over decades. And the reason it was, because people are like, well, everybody's going to forget how to do mathematics by hand. And even if you go back to, you know, Aristotle, um, or no, I think it was Socrates. Socrates and Plato, um, yeah. He, was, he, he said back then, you know, writing is just going to kill our ability to ever remember anything. And, and the truth would disappear, right? And right. Like, well, that and, and, and so, sort of happened. He wasn't totally wrong. <laughs> and so, yeah. So, I mean, so, so it's, it's, it's this unsettling feeling of being super excited yeah. about all of the superpowers that these are going to give our companies and our customers. And by our companies, I mean, you know, I'm an investor in a lot of companies as well. Mm-hmm. And I know you are too through your fund, but, you know, specifically, you know, most focused on data.world because that's where I'm CEO and spend most of my time. And it, we're in a reinvention phase right now. And so to me, that's unsettling. And then the other aspect of unsettling is this is the first time in my career, I'm 51 now, and, you know, I've been a technologist again since I was a really young kid. This is the first time in my career where people that I really thought I knew where they would net out on this generative AI (laughs) superpower, some of them are so dystopian, and I would have never oh, predicted yeah. it would be those people. Oh, yeah. And then some of them are so utopian, and that's the first time that's happened. I mean, that didn't happen with the invention of the internet. That didn't happen with mobile. That didn't happen even at the beginning of Facebook. I know that people start to get more dystopian later on with the social dilemma and everything else. But, but this is the first time in my career where right now in this moment, there are people that I consider very close friends that are really dystopian. The same. And and, and that to and me for is no, for no justifiable reason. The reason I say that is because there's three bad outcomes. One, you know, if we compare it to movies, one, Terminator, right, mm-hmm. kills us all. Two is, you know, iRobot, it's gotta make us slaves or pets or whatever to take care of protect us from ourselves. And three is kind of like Elysium, right? There's this huge class system, right? Mm-hmm. There's people who have access to tools and people who don't. Right. Those are all really bad. I think you'd be hard pressed to find other things that aren't subcategories of of one of those three. I think it's ridiculous. So I have a new op-ed coming out entitled On the Arrogance of Man in the Age of Thinking Machines. Mm -hmm. And the whole point of it is that, one, we're really bad at predicting technology. And two, like, would it kill us all or would it go like, Elon has this idea about Mars. And would it be like, you know what? You guys wait here one second. We'll be right back. Right. right? right. Then, right. We don't have to terraform it. We don't have to. We, we're right. going to be fine up there. Right. Yeah. Like, in fact, our relatives, our ancestors have already been there. They're the ones that sent you all the photos. It sounds great. You guys have fun. We're out of here. Right. Like, we, I mean, it's, it's, that's ridiculous, but it's just as ridiculous as it takes over and crashes the financial network or it does this or that. And there's tons of dangers. There's no doubt with any technology, mm-hmm. right? Like, like okay. that's just the, it's a double-edged sword. I mean, since we discovered fire, you could set some, that, yeah. something or someone on fire. The, right, <laughs> right, exactly. And for good or for horrible evil, right? Right, right. Um, so I want to pull on that string for a minute. Sure. Because you talked about the utopian and the dysopian groups that you've been talking to. All kinds of folks in the political realm are talking about what do we do? How do we slow this down? Or do we slow this down? Or do we speed it up? How do we regulate it? What do you guys say in terms of what's the path 
that gets us to the best possible outcome? That's a tough one, but I'll tell you this about the politicians. Like, you're done. Like, what do they do? When I was at IBM, I wrote a white paper on the regulatory environment and people trying to regulate and legislate technolo technological advances mm -hmm. and how that, that was fine now, but that eventually things moved at such a fast pace that there's almost no way that you could do that, right, at all. And I think that is – we are now there. I mean, when we did our interview, right. okay, with the two of you, I was like – Things are going to change, you know, and I think when you, we were sitting here, you were like, I thought you meant like in a few years, like I meant like the pace changes now. Since the South by presentation, there are 30 companies that offer generative AI presentation tools, 10 of which were in the audience at South by mm -hmm. who, who emailed me. And I was like, well, I don't, I can't be a part of another thing, but I agree. That's very nice of you to offer. Um, but, you know, you go to look at like Gamma app or any of these. And it's like, that's a thing that was a concept in March that is a product making money in May. Mm -hmm. That's nuts. Well, and I think what you're going to see, you're going to see two effects. I talked to three senators about this yesterday. Uh, ironically, they all called separately because, of course, the vice president is meeting with all the AI people and they're trying to figure out what to do. And they were trying to get some last minute you know, insights. Here's the, the fact. It's going to put a lot of people out of jobs. There's no doubt. Probably not the right way to say it. What you should say is it's going to eliminate a lot of jobs. It may create others. It may offset some. Like, we don't know. Bank tellers were protesting in the street in the 80s against ATMs because there were going to be no more bank tellers anywhere in the future. But they got reallocated, so they, re they originate loans. They do other services. So we just don't know. And by the way, I used to have a job mastering golden masters of things called compact disc, right? So it's like that job's been eliminated, but it's not like a creating world hunger or anything, right? Like mm -hmm. we, there's new things. So I think you have to look at it from a, a very different perspective. I think that what you're going to see is some country, hopefully it's America, is going to really embrace this from an entrepreneurial standpoint. And so, you know, what I told these centers yesterday was like, Stop trying to legislate it. Start trying to figure out how you can accelerate everything with it. So don't be like, okay, large language models, you can't this, or the copyright laws, or the this or the that, or whatever. There's going to be a million ways around that stuff. Do say, hey, how, what if we made a, a, you know, a regulatory movement, but as part of it, we also said, hey, as part of this bill, this is what we're going to do. We're going to create a million new businesses in the next month, two months, three months. And it's going to be mom and pop shops that use AI to do mm -hmm. something. And we're going to provide a little cash, a little resource. That sounds incredible to me. Yeah. What if you could, you could literally, you're in the first time in the history of the world, you could be like, I'm going to set up a plan to make a million new companies and entrepreneurs in a month. And we're working on something like that at, at StrangeWorks as a side project, which is why we got these calls. And it's like, why not? How wonderful would that be? I mean, I think it would be amazing to rich people's lives to do all that stuff. The The other aspect of that, though, simply is that we're going to see what I call the rise of the non-creative creative class. This is all the people that used to call me when I was at Academy and be like, I got an idea for a billion dollar mm -hmm. game or a mobile idea or whatever, that now they don't have to do that. And at the pace that the tools are progressing, if you saw where we went in November to where we were in January to where we were in, in April – Right with things like you know baby GPT uh, auto GPT and baby AGI, um, I don't know if you guys were following those, but bots that apps that create apps that create apps that are only available in a minimum of time. Mm -hmm. Think of how that improves the world. Think of security. Think of what if the software I'm using isn't written till the moment I'm using it, and it's written in the context of knowing what the latest security bugs are. And then by the way, as soon as I'm done, it's gone. So now it's not a point of entry to hack any of my stuff. That's amazing. Yeah. Right. There's so many great things that are going to come out of it. You know, 56,000 problems in the world in encyclopedia problems run out of Brussels. Three potential bad outcomes. I think we can figure it out. And if we're anything as humans, it's adaptive, right? Yeah. And and so this is another thing to adapt to that I actually think we'll, we will absolutely, you know, I don't want to say persevere because I don't think it's necessarily a, a big giant struggle. I think it's a mental struggle more than anything for a lot of people because we've taught people that their value is in the function they serve in society. Your value is your doctor. Your value is your technologist. Your value is this. And we don't value them as just people. And so people are worried about having that ripped out of them by this technology and not having anything to replace with it. And so 
one of the things that I'm working on is I start really get back into writing. I've been waiting for five years for this moment. So now I'm like super excited <laughs> is there's a, there's a, a friend of mine, Matt, who's a, a very famous clinical psychologist. And we're talking about the depression effects, not of you not being, you know, maybe we have universal basic income, maybe Sam Altman's paying us all, who knows, but the depression effects of like, I built my entire world around, I am the postman. I am a baker. I am a this, and now I'm not doing something. I'm a lawyer and not, I'm not doing law. I'm a writer and now I'm not doing as much writing. Like I, I think the, the, the unintended consequences don't lie in a robotic overlord doomsday scenario. They lie in maybe a giant increase in mental health issues. I'm, I'm going to uh, take the opposite that. side of that because it, it, as an augment and creating strengths and abilities that you didn't have, I can't draw a stick figure. Oh, no, life I'm, talking about, and now, I'm talking about a very specific class of people, right? which are the people right now who are like, don't believe it. It's not going to happen, whatever. Those people within the next 12 to 24 months are highly likely going to be at a, at a very bad situation with that because they won't just be like, that's what I thought. Right. I thought I can't draw a stick for you. This is amazing. <laughs> you know, yeah. Hey, what, you know, research. I wrote a auto prompt that prompts other prompts to do research. I am learning more this year than I've learned in my entire career by leaps and bounds. I am being so much more effective with my time. Exactly. Brett said when everything's, you know, kind of quantified, right. And, and I have the, a tool that lets me look at that. The world is amazing. It, it's almost like a limitless superpower because I can't draw and I can't research, you know, I don't want to do some of these things even, but, but everybody I meet at these conferences outside of tech, you know, we signed to do O'Reilly's chat GPT books, right? I think we can say that, but we're doing those books and every, and a bunch of people are like, well, book, do you know how fast it's changing? Blah, blah. It's like, right. For us, there are billions of people in the world who are unaware that any of this is even remotely going on. That's what worries me is the unintended consequence of people, you know, uh, having the fear and uncertainty and doubt, or more importantly, this depression about just like, what do I do with myself? And, and it can come from the opposite side. You know what the number one thing I'm seeing students uh, in the mentoring groups I'm doing ask is now I can do anything. What do I do? It's almost indecision, you know, paralysis analysis, right? Right. It, it's tough to ask me and Worley this question because we're both <laughs> incredibly adaptable. I mean, that's as an entrepreneur, you have to be incredibly adaptable. Like, Part, part of the reason, again, why I'm unsettled right now is because we are adapting right now. We are in that process of adapting right now, and we need to be world-class at adapting because startups are all about survival of the fittest. I think it's a false question to ask, like, how do you stop it? Because in the last, in the last couple of years, like during the worst of the pandemic and then the year following the worst of the pandemic, 2020 and 2021, there were more small businesses created in the United States than in any other point in history. Um, I actually think that what's happening with generative AI is going to be the biggest job creation engine in history and the biggest startup creation engine in history because the cost of doing really hard things and the limits of your imagination because of those hard things now are very, there's very different bounds. Like one of the things that I was terrified of in Austin is, you know, I've been here a long time. And when Austin Ventures, you know, kind of imploded, I thought, how are we going to replace a billion dollar fund Right. In Austin, how fast will that happen? It happened much faster than I thought, which was great. There's like tons of VCs now. There's tons of capital that moved in. It created lots of opportunity and it created a real explosion of startups in Austin, which is the best scenario possible. And although it is true that like a lot of jobs are like if you think about engineering, just take engineering for for a moment you're going to need to hire less incremental engineers. You're not going to go cut a bunch of engineers. I mean, it's better to have your engineers now much more productive, um, but you're going to hire less incremental engineers over time because each one is going to be so much more productive. But what does that free up? That frees up a lot of people to go and use the, the, the limitless 
imagination they have to dream up some new business. And then they make that move. It starts to get revenue traction. They start hiring people. And then maybe on a per unit basis, they hire less people for each startup, but it creates so much more opportunity. So to to ask this question of how do you contain it or this whole nonsense of the six-month moratorium is like saying, hey, we want to actually suppress society <clears throat> from the biggest productivity tool in the history of society, which is only possible because all of these things converged. Computing power, yep. internet, you know, if the web didn't happen before where this, you know, larval intelligence couldn't learn from the web and all of the things that had been shared freely and were able to be crawled and, and you know, put into a giant, you know, digital brain, all technology are building blocks towards the future and everything is built on top of other building blocks. Like Steve Jobs yeah. said it really well a long time ago in these lost archives at Santa Clara University where he said, you know, look, if you're in technology, you are ultimately like layers in the sand. You're not building the Taj Mahal. It's not going to stand the test of time. And everything you're building will be a layer that someone builds on top and then builds on top and then builds on top. And now we have the ultimate platform to basically build on top of. And, you know, when you're bounded by, do I have an engineering degree or do I have a degree in communications? You're really, your imagination is suppressed to what your capabilities are to ultimately invent something. If you take away those boundaries and now, you know, someone who's learning engineering for the first time can become like a 10X engineer of a year ago in six months or 12 months or however long that takes using you know, GitHub Copilot, which runs on top of OpenAI's Codex. I mean, that's that's a beautiful world because, you know, the the whole arc of technology has been about freeing people from prisons of the mind and prisons of capability. So to to try to suppress this, I mean, the the most inspirational talk I saw at the TED conference was where Saul Khan of Khan Academy stood up and said that he had been working with OpenAI integrated with Khan Academy in terms of the GPT-4 version that a lot of us just got access to. He had been working with that since August of last year. And what he showed in terms of a digital tutor for every child for free, it reminds me of the book, um, The Diamond Age by Neil Stephenson. That's right. It was like the diamond age had come alive and each child is going to have a free digital tutor that meets them where they're at and doesn't give them the answer, but teaches them how to solve the problem by getting them to try things and then correcting them the same way a tutor works with a child. And, you know, there's been tons of studies that if you have the financial means to get your child a tutor not only does it impact their school career, but it impacts their career forever, right? It's a compounding gain. And so do we want to live in a world where children are bounded by how much financial means their parents have or a world where every child can completely via merit have access to tools, assuming they have an internet connection that give them their own personalized digital tutor. And then he, sh then he flipped around and showed the tutor for the teacher. Mm -hmm. which was so cool, where each teacher then would be able to be prompted to bring out the best version of themselves and think very creatively about how they were going to teach material. And so now each teacher levels up their game. And to say, we're going to put a moratorium on that. Let's stop for six months and make sure that that children don't get access to personalized digital tutors, that that teachers don't get access to personalized digital tutors for them to up their game. It's it's like fighting the progress and the natural destiny of human history to a very extreme point. Like one of the one of the talks I gave at our synagogue, which was very unsettling for the people there, is that I said at the end of the day, what I've learned from, you know, I've been to TED for at least 17 times. 
And it was this was an amazing one because I got to take our 18-year-old daughter, and it was her first time there. And to see it through her eyes was just incredible. But I said, one of the things that I've learned from attending for so long, and it impacting the way I think about the world, is that our destiny has always been to become like God. And that means in every way. That means in the way of, you know, selecting the biological DNA of your child and the genetic characteristics they have. And, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be weird to us because we're not used to that. It'll be normal to the people that are born into that type of environment, but it is our destiny. And the, the gateway drug just for that, just take biology, is if you were given the choice, would you want to make sure that your child does not have the disease that runs in your family, right. that they for yeah. sure are not going to get the same disease that killed your grandmother or your mom or whatever else. Everybody would say yes. I mean, almost everybody would say yes to that. And then you're like, well, you know, I can also select this too. And then and then eventually it just becomes a norm. And so I, I just think this moratorium and, and, and this idea of like, we're going to shut this down is literally like saying, we're going to forget about everything we've learned in building technology to say, let's stop human progress. And, and that's, yeah. that's not our destiny. I mean, the moratorium is stupid. It's stupid. Full stop. It's full stop. And by the way, you can't lead a moratorium and then three weeks later announce your big AI company. All right. Like, right. I mean, it, it, right. everything about it is wrong. Right. Um, I totally agree. And I love what you were just saying. I think that when you when you look at you know the, the Khan Academy stuff is an amazing example of it being multidimensional and that it's like mentoring a student, mentoring a teacher, all of these things. And that's what is so wonderful about it is that there's an equal opportunity to be affected, right? Yeah. It doesn't matter that it, like like in the example you just gave. The teacher is not displaced by the mentor. Between student, it's building a better relationship between teacher and student for a better result and a better outcome, which right. is what we should be looking at are the right. affected outcomes uh, of, of teaching. I think it's a great example of, I mean, the, of what the, we're discussing. The best equalizer for humanity in the world, if you want a society where every child is given the full potential of their creativity, their, their mm -hmm. brain power the ability they have to create a better world, you know, if we want the next, you know, pick your favorite entrepreneur, whoever it is, we want the next version of that person born. Right. And with superpowers that the previous version of that person didn't have, That's right. then I want to live in that type of world. I don't want to live in a world where we suppress these structures in this artificial way because we're all afraid of sci-fi. I mean, Anytime I hear someone talking about this, I'm like, remember that it is science fiction, fiction yes, <laughs> and it is bounded. Like, like, look, I, I, I think shows like Black Mirror stuff like that. I enjoy shows like that because they do show you what happens if things are fully unchecked. But like when I read Homo Deus by Yuval Noah Harari, you know, he basically assumes that, and I'm a vegetarian. He's a vegetarian. He assumes that like the way we treat animals um, by, you know, all the things I know about factory farming. I won't get into all that. But, you know, I basically learned so much that I'm like, okay, I'm out. And he assumes that the way we treat them is going to be the way the machines treat us. But what everybody misses in that is they miss that human beings and societies evolve to become more ethical over time. They always do. I mean, like things that happen, you know, 100, 200 years ago. We wouldn't want to live in that country well, today. Yeah, we, it, you know, where like slavery is normal. It's and like people else. saying chivalry is not dead. It's like chivalry doesn't mean what you think it means. Chivalry means like I had a horse and a giant sword and an army. And I wouldn't just like kill you and take your stuff. It didn't, right. but, you know, it wasn't it wasn't like uh, I was being sweet. I mean, just if you but, take but take, you, take meat for example, that's right. Just for just for a small example, like for sure. The solution is we're not even going to need the animals anymore. We'll just create the meat from anything. That's already happening. You know, we're investors in a company called Upside Foods that raised four hundred million last Earth Day. Like that's just inevitable. Why is it inevitable? Because it takes one tenth the land cost and one tenth the water cost, right. and there's no animals involved. And one of the biggest backers is Tyson, because the CEO of Tyson said I would sell chicken all day long if I didn't have to involve the chicken. 
Um, that's just like one of many, many, many examples. It's going to be accelerated by right. quantum computing and but you, data. But you bring, so you bring up a couple, of, a couple of points to touch on, which is the, the you know, for, you said, oh, you know, the future world, and you want to live in that world. That's because entrepreneurs tend to be dreamers. They tend to be mm-hmm. looking ahead like that. But there, there's a couple disconnects. One is the, the generational disconnect. Like my kids, I don't expect to drive a car, mm-hmm. right? I just don't. My wife is wants them to have that experience and all. I don't know. And, to, you know, I think the pace of change is going to accelerate dramatically totally from, from here forward. But my kids also walk in every morning when they wake up and they say, hey, Google, blah, blah, blah. Hey, they already talk to their computer. They already do, you know, they're so much disconnected from where we were at that age or from where even their older brother was at that age that it's incredible. And so you talked about the, would I pick this genetic engineering or pick that or whatever? It'll become normalized. I and mean, people used to be like, whoa, cars, <laughs> where's your horse, right? Mm-hmm. Like that's no different than anything that you're talking about. Right, it's, absolutely. It's, it's just progress. And we're going to need to teach children to be highly, highly adaptable. Like right now we teach them to be way too rigid and way too structured. How you win as an entrepreneur is you've got to be incredibly curious. You've got to be incredibly adaptable. You have to really embrace technological shifts and become world-class at those when they happen. I mean, like you can go back to the internet and like Microsoft was too late. Yep. You know, you go back to mobile, Facebook was too late. Um, So it's like easy to look at those things in hindsight and You know, the company I was talking to, one of the largest software service companies in the world, just prior to this, they're in the state of like, hey, we've got to really level up or we're going to be a dinosaur. And that's true for every company. That is Um, huge. So that's a great way for us to kind of then circle into what does all this mean for Austin, right? I think there's there's two ways to kind of think. One, one of the things that I've talked a lot about, we've talked about on the podcast is that I think something that's really powerful about Austin is, and we, we call this probably the power of and, right? Which is, it is AI and quantum. It's computation and uh, AI, right? It's these different technologies coming together, <laughs> right? Is I think something that's really interesting. Also something that I've seen, and correct me, is, is we we don't have any, um, you know, none of the LLMs are being developed here. We're building layers on top. So that's <laughs> an interesting question of, is that the right sustain? Is that sustainable? Is that something that's going to be a differentiator, or is that going to be a problem coming up? So, how does our ecosystem fit into this kind of rapidly changing? Because we are seemingly, you know, the next big powerhouse in innovation. So we obviously want to be mm-hmm. moving towards where that is going and defining that. So, I tend to think that that system of growing a community, a city, uh, all of those things. It, is all a moot point now. I, I think it's gone. I think w- as these tools get spread further and further, innovation spreads with these tools because of what Brett said, which I agree with 100%, which is there are a ton of people who have great ideas, no ability to research it, no ability to form a thing. Um, David Hudson, who's my co-author on the on the Learning Chat GP book, uh, he uh, wrote a site called Mill Missions. Okay, uh, It's a recipe site. So as an example... The domain was picked by an AI, uh, negotiated for because it was already bought. WordPress was picked by the AI. It was set up by the AI. It publishes every day by looking at Google Trends, what are trending things that people are looking for in recipes. All the art is AI. It just sits there and completely runs itself. Um, So David's a very talented programmer, but it didn't take a lot of talented programming to do that. And so now everybody who has an idea... I mean, ChatGPT can write really good code. And people say it hallucinates. I have a different opinion on that. I think you know, these large language models have just a bunch of data, right? So you're like, I asked it a random question. It told me something wrong. It's like, well, you don't know how to use it. Like, you have to teach it. Like, this is what we're going to do. And let me give you some context. Because all that data without context is useless, right? You give it context, it's been incredible. It's like, think about that. Think about children publishing their own books. How many kids, how many kids' schools have publishing day at their school, every kid's school. And, and how many of those kids come up with really inventive stories? Now you take that story, you put it in the chat GTP, you put some prompts in, you put it in the mid journey and your kid published an actual book at a quality level that last year would have taken a publisher Absolutely. or at least a publisher and artist and all this. last year, not 20 years ago, I know, not 30 years ago, 12 so months amazing. ago, right? It's the most incredible time to be alive the history of our species. And I'm afraid that a bunch of people are going to 
get left behind or squander it. And one of the things I have is a personal goal is I'd like to make sure everybody, look, you choose not to do it. That's awesome. I'd like to make sure everybody has the opportunity, right? Because I agree with everything Brett's saying on the kids are, the kids aren't the future anymore. The kids are the present because now their knowledge just got zapped up. Now your teenager can look up stuff that they would have come to you and they may know about you about. They can create code. They can do these things. What an incredible world to live in when all this creative ideas can be delivered, not in months or years, but in like seconds, minutes, hours, days. Mm -hmm. My seven-year-old loves Roblox, loves it, drives me nuts. Oh, he, kids love it, he, so want, it. <laughs> he wanted to know how to make a Roblox game. I go, I don't know. Why don't you research that, right? So he starts by asking Google, you know, hey, Google, how do you make a Roblox game? It's like, here's some website links. And then I said, you know what? I could set up Whisper and have it where he can talk to his iPad or whatever. And so I got him set up with ChatGTP. And he's like, how do you make a Roblox game? And it, and it reads it back to him with the assistance because, you know, he's in first grade. So he has like a vocabulary of right. 400 words or whatever. <laughs> and, and it reads. And so now he can talk to it. And then he's like, oh, it, it writes code in this thing, the scripting language called like Lao or whatever it's called. And oh, okay, he's, uh, can you write the code? You know, because that's what kids ask. Can you do it then? And it's like, here's the code for a game. And, you know, he will more than likely deploy a Roblox game with the assistance of these tools, practically by I mean, very little input or guidance from me. They, if you assume that the regional that idea is going away because of these tools, then that assumption means that the human human interaction and innovation doesn't have value no, as, as, innova as an innovation engine doesn't have any value. No, not well, not necessarily. I'm being over dramatic. I'll, in, I'll, but. I'll be really clear on that. What I'm saying is that it's innovation everywhere, right? And, and we don't know where these great innovations have come out. I've been a critic of the whole. Everybody around the world comes to Silicon Valley. I manage the research labs in Haifa. I happen to think that was probably one of the most innovative places I've ever worked. Mm -hmm. I go to the Valley and I remember working in the Haifa Research Labs. I'm like, Haifa was may, way more innovative than the Valley. Okay, yeah. like hands down. I I'll be in, speaking in Haifa I, next month. I worked in the research yeah. labs in Zurich. I, I would say I think that what was going on there was much more innovative than that. It's not about loss of value. That is the problem. That is the thing that I think just really gets on my nerves. Everything is the AI is going to take something from you. It's going to take something from Brett. There's going to be a two 12 year olds that build a data company and they're going, that's not true, sure. right? It's going to take artists and there's, there's going to be no more artists because it's just mid journey. That's also not true, right? There's like, I think that's the problem I have is not just the fear. I mean, that would be doubt. true if uh, we did not embrace these technologies because D right. someone would come along and say, these guys are too fat, too slow. Like That's right. That's too, exactly not right. Not adaptable. And frankly, then we'd deserve. And by the way, done. I don't see a lot of negative that. People are like, well, this could affect the stock market. This could that. Maybe it needs to be affected. Right. Maybe some of these big companies are resting on the laurels. Maybe yeah. we're not innovating. Maybe instead of one giant conglomerate, we need 100,000 five-person businesses around the world to make the world right. do better. And maybe those grow in the conglomerates. Right. Who knows? And by the way, who cares? Yeah. I prefer to run my life and my business by not having arbitrary deadlines. You know, your software releases this date. There is no way in any way you could tell me like, this is the date. This why is that the date? It's a date because you thought it's going to take that long or you just associated with an event or you did something. It's completely arbitrary, right? Like we just release when we're ready, you know, but it's like you, you think about unintended consequences. I definitely value those. I'm always worried about those. I'm worried about those with this, but I'm, but I'm, I'm more on the side of like, why would you, be paralyzed with fear and be focused on all, all the, what it's, what you're going to lose. What about what you're going to gain? What about the, the network effects of somebody else in society gains and Br Brett and I's entrepreneurs, we gain from that, from a thing we didn't even know. They make a new auto GPT that does something with data and he assimilates it. And all of a sudden he just saved more money has a better product, did this and that. Everybody's happy. Right. And you know, there's so much, and that's, and that's, it, it's a world of opportunity, not of problems. And, and I, it really annoys me that so many people, especially politicians are so focused on negative outcomes. But it's like, do you know how, you know, I, I told every Senator I talked to yesterday, I'm going to DC on Monday to meet with the administration, everybody. And the message is this in the country that embraces it the fastest becomes the next superpower. Absolutely. Period. Right? 
embrace it. Don't be trying to, okay, you want to do some regulation? Maybe you want to do something and get some of these large language models opened up or have some rules. That's great. But your attention should be on how do we get these into as many kids' hands as possible? How does the government support an educational program on how to use generative AI for starting an elementary school on yeah. every program in the U.S.? That would do more to advance our country and our society here and the global society than anything they could do with this trying to – I'm so glad to hear you say that because I was wondering what your opinion was. I figured it was the same, but I'm so glad to hear what you're saying because well, it's, it's, just, what's interesting. it's just ludicrous to be it's, like – and by the it's way – It's very random. You can't actually predict that's right. uh, on this <laughs> yeah. subject. I mean, but one of the things I find that's so disingenuous about it is that the, the same dreamers who became wealthy, who now have all right. this money exactly. and power – are now turning into the, I want to protect all my money and power and I don't want to be disrupted. And so shut this whole thing down. And I think that's part of it. I, th I think that's a subconscious fear. I don't think yeah. they're like consciously afraid because of that. I think they're rationalizing it through all the sci-fi they've seen. But one thing I want to come back to, I want to come back to your question. So I've thought about this a lot. You know, is Silicon Valley the place historically, plus Seattle, where... The platforms have been created that then all of us operate on top of. Is that a bad thing? Is that a good thing? I think the best example I heard recently is by Thomas Tungus, who founded his own VC firm recently called uh, Theory. And he was at Redpoint for a long time. He backed Looker and a lot of companies in the data analytics space and had an amazing track record and obviously raised his $210 million fund with Theory pretty quickly. And he said, look, if you do the analysis, and I believe him because he's a very data-driven guy. I haven't personally fact-checked this analysis, but I, I believe him. If you do the analysis on, if you spun out AWS out of Amazon, you spun out Azure out of Microsoft, and you spun out GCP out of Google, you just take the top three. Obviously, there's other players there. I mean, Oracle has their thing, and there's other people that have you know, cloud computing platforms. That's around 2.1 trillion of market value. If you take all the SaaS companies that have been built on top of those three platforms, and Data.World is built on top of AWS, um, that is $2.1 trillion. Mm -hmm. Now, which one do you want to invest in? Do you want to be like smart enough to invest in the one of three companies at the beginning that, become, that you could predict somehow decades later <laughs> would become the platforms that everybody operate on top of. And that's kind of where OpenAI is right now, right? They just did right. their recent round at over 20 billion. And, you know, they're probably on their way to be a $200 billion type company in a platform that, you know, is way out in the lead. And it's amazing that that happened for such a small team versus Google, uh, especially when Google invented the transformer. But that's how tech goes. Again, sediment, everybody's building on top of it's layers. Very, very of the classic sand. Clayton Christensen. Right. They don't want to go out yeah. because they can't have search right. be disrupted. So, so Austin historically has been a application layer kind of city um, when it comes to tech. But Austin's diversifying a lot. There's a lot of CPG companies now that this is going to help accelerate everything they're doing from content creation to new product discovery to, you know, what additives, how do we make these things taste better and still be healthy? I mean, everything is going to accelerate for those companies. And then you have lots of elements of Austin in other areas. I mean, one of the companies we're investors in is, is Everlywell. I don't know where exactly they fit. Um, are they CPG? Are they healthcare? Are they kind of in the middle? Um, they're kind of both. And that's a very successful company. It's worth, I think, I always like to hold them as a, as a great convergence company. It's they're a great convert. That's a great e commerce place, yeah. versus yeah. to lab testing and outputs. Right. They're moving into telehealth since. Right. Know. So, so, so I think that it is normal human behavior and competitiveness to think about like our city versus other cities or Texas versus other states or whatever else. And that's okay. I mean, that's, that's the way we're wired. And that comes out of like, you know, the way we evolved as, as tribes and, you know, the many wars that were fought to get to the place that we are today and all that happened in human history. So that's kind of hardwired for us. But part of the reason why the platforms have been created in those places is not because those places have people with superior brains. Okay, it's because 
there is a accumulation of capital that occurred that created many more experiments than Austin has ever had. Like we have a you combine everything. If you combine forever. everything, if <laughs> exactly. you take if you take exactly. the cumulative amount of VC that's been spent in Silicon Valley right. on the people there, yes. and you take the cumulative amount that's been spent in Austin, um, there's a disconnect. And capital is power. And so, you know. Again, getting back to the Khan Academy example, if you just have a completely merit-based society around the world where it's just about the potential of a child and you take capital out of the equation because Khan Academy is free, is that a better world? Does does that upset some people? They're going to now have all types of people that, you know, maybe they don't want to see how intelligent these people are and can, you know, help benefit the world or the first country to just go all in on AI. I mean, I, I think it was like Germany or one company that like banned open AI. And I was like, oh my gosh, like you're uh, banning the Italy. Guten- Italy. Italy. Yeah. I was like, you're banning the Gutenberg press. I mean, right. you're like, you're basically I think, saying, I think they I tried live to do that too ages. though. So I think it's okay. the same They place. probably <laughs> did. Right. And so, so, so you've got, uh, and they're, like I said, the digital calculator example, there were many, many places, right. many colleges that banned that. But you're bringing um, up such on. a, you're bringing up such a good point because, you know, I'm saying it's innovation. Every, I don't think it's about innovation. I think he just summed up, there's innovation everywhere. There's not an ecosystem that has the capital to drive the business, that has the acquirers, all in that. I mean, he's exactly right. When Silicon Valley started, why do a lot of funds in the Valley now use a European waterfall instead of American waterfall? Because uh, we got together, started a fund because we were both you know, engineers, you know, 200 and 201 at Google or whatever. Okay. And now we've got money and we're like, well, now we're going to invest in something. We have a micro fund and then we sell something. And all of a sudden we're like, he's like, you know what? I think I did that. And I think I did it. And we split up and it just kind of like fractionalized and more capital came in and it built a incredible economic engine, like yeah. unparalleled, like there's no doubt, but what does that have to do with the innovation? Right. It's not that there's better ideas there. It's not that those universities are way better. I mean, if you think they are, go to the East Coast. They'll tell you how those universities are way better, right? Right. Like, sure. we'll tell you how, like, you know, we have UT and a and right? You know right, what I mean? Right, right. Um, it's a, but, it, I mean, you nailed it, which is an immense – if you look at the money it used to be when I first moved here 30 years ago, the money invested in a year in the Valley would be, like, 10 years or 20 years of money or something. I mean, it's crazy disproportionate what you're talking yeah. about. I think that uh, the big meta question to ask in terms of Austin being the application layer right now, and that, again, is changing, it's diversifying, but that has been a part of our heritage, starting with Trilogy and Tivoli and yep. continuing with Bizarre Voice and everything else that's come, your prior company as well. Um, Positively too, so. <laughs> yeah, well, and that, yeah. <laughs> totally, so yeah. so the, the thing to kind of predict is when Microsoft came out with Windows, there were many applications built on top of it, just like there are many applications built on top of OpenAI. Which applications does the operating system eventually just subsume and say, those are great feature ideas, those aren't standalone companies, and as a result, there's going to be disruption there. there like Microsoft Windows did put companies out of business um, because they said, hey, that little application, that's not just part of Windows. Maybe they acquired, maybe they just uh, built it. But that is part of just the technological cycle. And so, you know, one of the things I said at a board meeting recently, not a data.world board meeting, but another board I serve on when we were talking about this and, and, and how that company need to go all in on generative AI is I said, you know, it's a very good time to be an incredibly complex SaaS company because That's data.world right. world is so complex. I mean, we have over 95 integrations of everything from, you know, Tableau and Looker and Power BI and, you know, well, that, that's um, the... and, 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 you know, Snowflake and Databricks to, you know, things like SAP and Netiza and all that. So like, you know, if you're a very simple application company that's built on top of OpenAI, look, you may just become part of the operating system that may be out of business. You, know, you say that about Microsoft. I remember being an Apple developer in the late 80s, early 90s, and they'd all have these little tools that you'd buy and mm-hmm. made everything great. And then the next OS would be like, it does that all now, right? right? Like, I mean, that's right. It. Right. But we are also 
incredibly complex. We're not doing data, right? We're doing more right. infrastructure, but tying into dozens of quantum machines around the world, all the HPC far, all the, and then tying into the apps. And we tie into some of the same, you know, the SAPs mm -hmm. and the MATLABs and the Mathematicas and stuff. And you're right. For us, it's like, this is the greatest thing ever. Right. Like, I 100% right. like, agree. It's like, but yeah. this is the thing. You know, you said something earlier. I wanted to ask you a question. Um, it's not a loaded question. But um, you were talking about the 10X engineer mm -hmm. and bringing them up. And and, I, and you're talking about Austin and the economy. So so let's be blunt. We want to have as many of those people that are getting brought up here as possible, Absolutely. right? That's what drives that, okay? Yeah. But my question is, in doing that, does engineering get commoditized further. Like I can remember when web developers, when Stephen Mill and Lou Gershner asked me, you know, like, what the hell is a web developer? Is that an engineer or not? Right. right <laughs> they were right. making like 400 grand to build websites or whatever. And now you've got Wix. I think, whatever. I mean, like, like what, what do you think? What do you see as the, cause I love that perspective. Well, what do you see as the effects of that? So, so, so like anything, it highly depends. I mean, one of the companies that I'm absolutely fascinated with, it's one of our biggest partners at data.world is Snowflake. Yeah. And if you put yourself in the position of raising money back when Snowflake raised money, the pitch was something like this. I'm going to build a data warehouse as a service on top of AWS, who already has a data warehouse as a service. And by the way, Azure has a data warehouse as a service. And by the way, Google has a data warehouse yeah. service. I'm going to build it on top as an application layer on top of AWS. And I'm going to create one of the biggest software companies in the world because I'm going to make it dirt simple from a That's UI right. perspective That's for right. people to operate that data warehouse and configure that data warehouse. And a lot of VCs laugh them out of the room. They're like, you are crazy. That is I something. Feel, I think we feel their pain. Right. Let's be honest. And, and, and you know, <laughs> now Snowflake, they did the largest software IPO in history um, in 2020. They're worth about $50 billion. And it's an application. That, now, they're but across that's a problem. many but, different. But that's the problem with the investors you're talking about. I didn't mean it. But you're yeah. like, of course they said that. But at the same time, by making it simpler, they're also getting a much broader market. They're bringing right. a bunch of people so, I mean, that weren't there before. Let me answer your question directly. Um, but I just wanted to set it up that way. So is this going to commoditize engineering? It is going to commoditize engineers that are not very creative. Um, it is going to commoditize engineers who are fast at coding, but not very imaginative. Like the right. people that could just crank out like, you know, code very, very quickly, but didn't yeah, do like it. If your whole career is building APIs. I have bad news. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've got a funny story about that. Um, it, it just a real aside because it's a really funny story. You know, at UT Austin, when I went, my parents were like, you're going to UT and that's that. I didn't do computer science. A lot of people assume I did because I've been programming since I was seven. And the, because the, the projects in computer science at the time were coding printer drivers. Right. And I was like, no, I'm not going to do that. I've already created my own bulletin board system. I'm creating an internet game. I'm not going to code a printer driver. I'm never going to do anything like that. It's so stupid in my career. And, and so they guided me towards management information systems. And I told that story so many times, and I was at, um, I was picking up our daughter when she was younger. <laughs> I had a math shirt on. Guy's like, hey, you know, where'd you go to school? I was like, UT. I was like, you know, yeah, love math. You know, my grandfather taught mathematics, you know, his whole career. And he's like, well, did you do CS? And I told that story, and I was like, where do you go? He's like, UT. I was like, oh, you know, what do you do? And he's like, I did CS. I was like, what do you do for a living now? It's like, I code printer drivers. Right, right, right. I, yeah, he yeah, was yeah. not okay. kidding. And in the car, I told, I told, I told uh, Rachel, I was like, I'm pretty sure she's not going to be your friend anymore. Like, I just right. said something that is so horrible. And I, I, I literally almost went, I, I almost passed out because I can't remember what I said after that. Um, but that was like the one story that got me in that, in that time. So getting to the engineer and does it commoditize, look, it's inevitable that any any engineer that is trying to progress their career is going to take advantage of the superpower. It's almost like it's almost like an IQ test. If you know that this thing exists, right, and you're a student, right, and you're not using it to help you with your assignments, could agree more. Then there's something wrong. One of the um, things the government's worried about is like its effects on education, right? And and I was like, I would be worried about the students who aren't trying to use right. it. So the <laughs> right. engineers like, it, that are... Anybody test. that's still <laughs> using a slide rule at right. this point is way behind the curve. So right. this has been amazing and fascinating, and we could go on for another hour, but we can't. 
Yeah. So I got to ask each of you, and I'm not even sure how to ask our normal question, but I'm just going to say, what's the one thing that's next? Oh, gosh. I think what I said earlier, I think that we're going to have a absolute explosion in the number of startups created and as an effect of that, a derivative explosion in the number of jobs, even though each individual company will employ less people Can because they can get a lot more done. I think yeah. that's what's next. And I, and I really want Austin to be the leader of that. You're either the one doing the commoditization or you're being commodified. Right. And so I want Austin to embrace the technology and be go into this bold new era. And I'm just not worried about like, are we going to be so stupid that we don't put some guardrails on this? We're going to hook this up to nuclear arms. Of course. I mean, come on, like we're not that dumb. I mean, no, I mean, I spoke, I spoke to a publisher yeah. recently and they're like, but it could get things incorrect. I was like, wait, so you're, you're going to let it write it, but you're not going to put it through the normal editorial process. Like really? you're not going to yeah. fact check it. Right? Like, like how does it change your job? Right. You right. still do the same stuff. You just did it more efficiently. Yeah. I mean, like I, I agree and tying into what you said about Austin growing as a community. I think Austin could be next. I 100% agree with what he's saying on, uh, we have an opportunity now to fulfill the dream Every entrepreneur and technologist in Austin I've known for 30 years has had, which is Austin is this kind of the, the place for the thing, right? Mm -hmm. Like we do that. We take the the leadership ring, you know, the, the gold ring, so to speak. This is the opportunity because the reason I moved to Austin was because every waiter you see also goes to UT and has a master's in information tech or whatever and plays in a band and also is a painter and does, you know, like it, it's this commute, it's this community of like everybody's talented. Everybody plays an instrument. Everybody paints or does an art or they sculpt or whatever. It is a very creative city. So when you take those kind of people and you give them this kind of power and within the context of what you were asking about growing it, what he was just saying, like, absolutely. Austin is next if we're lucky. Brett. Burley, thank you so very, very much for joining us on the Austin Next podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. A real pleasure.